recession in some countries. Now, Dilma ended up impeached, not so much because of the scandal, but they had legislation. Now, people scoff a lot at legislation as if we have enough, but we've actually been passing some in Jamaica, and I'm going to speak to it quickly in a minute. That's going to be making a hell of a difference as it relates to corruption, if we know about it, if we know about it. Now, this was actually what we call the fiscal responsibility laws that determined how Brazil borrowed and how Brazil spent. And basically what the president did was, to put it in basic terms, she cooked the books so that it would look a little bit better as she was going into an election. Now, thanks to the, what would be the Auditor General of Brazil, she was able to share what she found coming out of an audit, which ended up in Dilma stepping down. And then went Lula da Silva, who ended up getting 12 years in prison. Now, that's a former president. So when you think about big man can't go to jail, it certainly can be done if the will is there. And when I talk about will, I'm not really referring to political will. I have a theory that whatever becomes public will translates into political will. Can I get a clap on that one? Thank you very much, Pat. <laughs> Interestingly enough, they had an election in January, and they have a new president, and everybody thought, well, okay, new president comes in, maybe the pursuit of justice would end. No, not at all. Last month, Michel Temer also was arrested and is about to apparently go down, and he's disappeared also. Now, if you take a quick look at this picture, this is what Brazil presidents have at their access. Three palaces, planes, helicopters. That's a lot to throw at an individual. Very compelling. And I can assure you that there are inducements and enticements that come to them way beyond. Now, I don't know about the average human being, but what I think is that we ought to have systems in place that don't leave presidents and public officials relying on, well, how well did your mother raise you? But we should have mechanisms that are triggered immediately as certain things go wrong. Now, Jamaica, hmm, I'm going to leave the impact with a statistic in terms of the impact of corruption. Jamaica's gross domestic product, the last time it was measured, was 14.8 billion U.S. dollars. And I've heard Metro Siaga sharing a figure, 734 million U.S. dollars is what we lose every year to corruption. And I've wondered where Metro got this. And then by coincidence, I discovered. Because if the statistics say that developing countries in particular lose between 5% to 20% of their GDP every year. Well, I said, okay, let's calculate it and see how Jamaica is doing. Now, when you calculate 14.8 billion, and when you take 5%, I'm sorry, I asked for a raise of hands. If it's between 5 and 20%, do you think J J Jamaica would be at the low end of the threshold of corruption? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I am a woman of generous spirit, so I worked with the 5%, and it actually turned out to be 94.6 billion Jamaican dollars, which is roughly what that 734 US that Metro was referring to. Now, can I just pause for a minute and ask you to think about, Prince, what we could do with 94.6 billion dollars every single year? Bobby, you would have that port ready. Long time, absolutely. Matter of fact, gentle folks, if we cut that in half, we would still be building schools and hospitals. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine what this country would look like. Do you understand then the extent of the problem? And don't you wonder where this money is going? Yes, we do. Well, follow me. My take on it is that the environment in Jamaica is actually very, very ripe for change. And so I'm going to share with you a list, and I'm going to ask you not to just look at it one by one, but just step back and look at the entire list and see if you wouldn't come to the same conclusion that I am coming to. Let us start with one of the things that I think we definitely have going for us, which I think we're underestimating. Legislation. Just two examples. The access to information legislation has been around. How long now, Doc? 20 years. 20? 20 years, two decades. Can I see a show of hands of how many Jamaicans in the room have actually utilized that act in order to get information? Just a show of hands. Yeah, guys, this is not more than 10. Not more than 10. 
this is a piece of legislation where everything that I've shown you coming out of the Auditor General's report, if you simply wanted to know anything more about it, did you know that you could simply write to a government agency and say, I would like documentation to substantiate what has been done to remedy this breach? This is a tool that the government of Jamaica has placed in the hands of citizens. And yet, in a room that I really believe have an investment here, and here in the subject, we could only find 10. The, in the environment is riper than we think it is. FRF there stands for Fiscal Responsibility Framework. And time does not permit me, but ever since we entered into the standby agreement with the IMF, Jamaica has been doing amazing things in terms of tightening up the controls that are going to prevent us from so easily moving to the place where we were, where every time we earned a dollar, we actually owed a dollar 40. I still cannot wrap my head around that. Now, can I get an applause for the fact that every time we now earn a dollar, we, we are what? We're only paying back what now? 96 cents. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That is amazing. That is amazing. And uh, we owe a lot of that to legislation. All right, so that's one. And there's a lot more in terms of the legislative framework that started with Dr. Peter Phillips and that has continued with Shaw and now Dr. Clark. And I just want to say, in my studies, one of the biggest challenges for developing countries has been policy discontinuity. Yeah? Basically means, uh, here's a good idea, and this party was doing with it, and another one come in and forget about that. It speaks to the maturity and how much we have evolved, and it's really something that I am immeasurably grateful for to the political <laughs> leaders for. I really am. I really am. Now, information is what's going to turn this country around. I, I kid you not, because that's what's working in all the other countries where they are turning corruption around. So the fact that there is press freedom, the majority of the things that I showed you happening in Jamaica, you could get that from the newspaper if you are paying attention. I believe it is the Paris organization called Something Without Borders, it's slipping me now, that, uh, that rates countries, 100 countries around the world. And Jamaica, where do you think Jamaica is? Where one is the best, 100 is the worst. We are in the top eight on the planet for freedom to access information, including the press. <laughs> Absolutely. The environment is right. Oversight agencies, there is a plethora. And maybe because we have gotten so used to hearing about it, we assume this is something just every country just has. That's not true. Auditor General, Contractor General, MOCA, CTAC, Indicom, DPP, Public Defender, Public Accountability Inspectorate. How many have ever heard of the Public Accountability Inspectorate? One, two, three, four, five, six. And yet every government official that has been removed from their jobs in the last 15 years, it was based on reports generated by a department in the Ministry of Finance known as the Public Accountability Inspectorate. The Bank of Jamaica governor, the student loan director, I do believe even the president of UTEC, and I'm forgetting the fourth. Those are high public officials. So who says we can't hold people to account? Yeah. Fourth is parliamentary oversight. You have been watching and seeing the tenacity of the Public Accounts Committee and the PAAC. There's a different shift. I have been watching them for years. And I know it's Petrojam, but I don't think it's just Petrojam. Have you seen the reports I shared with you that have been going on for decades? Ah, uh, so it's not about Petrojam in and of itself. The environment is ripe for change. Now, the other thing about parliamentary oversight is that Jamaica can actually listen while it is happening. In Trinidad and Tobago, the citizens of our country don't know what's happening in chamber because that's where it's discussed, in chamber. Do not underestimate the fact that we can now turn on our computers or our television and see the debate for ourselves. That is a very, very powerful access to information. Robust civil society, and when I, when I talk about laying the foundations, JAMS will be standing on the foundation for the work of many, many CSOs, civil society organizations that came before. Too many to list, but Jamaicans for Justice, 
the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition, the Jamaica Environmental Trust, National Integrity Action, which has been doing an amazing work. But when I speak of robust civil society, I'm not just stopping there. Let's not forget things like EPOC. Pat, you say you believe in partnership. That is an amazing partnership that the International Monetary Fund says is unique to Jamaica, and if they could replicate that around the world, what could they do to turn the other countries around? And that's amazing. It's amazing. That's amazing. That's 11 Jamaicans who work full-time assisting the government to steer them through, which, wor which was one of the most difficult periods of our nation's history, financially speaking. Number five, our development partner. There's a lot happening in the space when it comes on to development partners, but I'm gonna level with I'm gonna level with you and tell you the truth. Sometimes there are things we need to get done. And if enough people outside that tell us to get it done, it don't happen. But it means that there is a value to be placed on partnership. There's a lot that's moving right now in the IMF and in the G seven the G twenty countries as it relates to corruption. And I do believe that Barbados, Bur Bahamas and another country have had to change their legislation about this same beneficial ownership. The pressure is brought to bear from the outside. Things happen on the inside. Number seven is technology. I live in an era. We're at the press of a button. I can speak to the prime minister of Jamaica. Now, there was so much happening in my father and my grandfather's time. Far more, I would say, investment in the future of the country and yet they didn't have it as easy as I think we have it to engage our political leaders, yeah? Technology is the way of the future, and I think that's, as I'm gonna show in a few minutes, how JAMP is planning to harness that for the benefit of um, accountability. And last, but by no means least, self-driven, I call them the intrepid generation of young Jamaicans that are here with us. I'm counting on them to harness everything that is present here and to assist us in moving Jamaica forward. Now, would you agree with me that this is a really positive look at what can happen? <laughs> yeah, it is. And the question is, how have we been leveraging the opportunities and these tools that the politicians, our governments, have given to us? Now, let's talk about the possibilities. What is JAMP and this accountability toolbox that we are hoping will contribute to the conversation that's been ongoing about change? Now, JAMP has three tools that it wants to offer. We have dubbed one the accountometer, another one is the MP tracker, and the third one is a legislative tracker. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on the accountometer because that one deals more specifically with the issue at hand. Now, the accountometer is, in essence, dealing with the issue of accountability. I have a very, very simple theory about how we can really turn this issue of corruption around, and that is if we focus on accountability. When I was young, my brother used to ask me, of all the superpowers, which one do you want, Jeanette? And my answer was always the same. I want to be invisible. It was just so obvious why that would be the coolest thing in the world. But that is the very same characteristic about corruption that is making it so difficult and intractable. There is nobody who is acting corruptly, who is leaving minutes behind of the conversation we've just had. There are no breadcrumbs like Hansel and Gretel showing the DPP how to make her way to the culprit, right? And just about every time the contractor general has submitted a report with a recommendation that somebody be prosecuted, what is the response from the DPP? I have no material evidence to prosecute, and she will never. So I am proposing to Jamaica that we turn our sights on respect for rules and procedure and policy. It's very simple. If you go down to Ligany right now, there's a hardware store and there's a sign that says, if you are caught taking a tip, you will be dismissed on the spot. If it was government, we would put up CCTV, we would do investigations, we would have a long route, and we probably wouldn't end up firing on anybody. That hardware has decided that there is something they want to preserve in the relationship with their customers and even with the staff, and they realize that the environment is of such that if you start to take money for taking the things to your car, then you're going to start to lose something that you hold dear. I am saying to you, Jamaica, that if we have rules and regulations about how we 
contract goods and services from the private sector. If you are caught going contrary to that, then you should be held accountable. There should be zero tolerance for breaking the rules because guess what? That's the only way you're gonna be corrupt. It's simple. How do you spend $3.1 billion without approval from the Ministry of Finance, from your board, and you're still at your desk? Did you realize that after that happened, the Ministry of Finance announced that we are actually going to have to raise NIS because in 2029, that fund is going to be in trouble? They raised it already. It was in last year, December. I heard the announcement, and the Auditor General reported in it in February. Now, the Financial Investigation Division is supposed to be investigating, and it has been 15 months, Jamaica, right? So my take on it is that let us start with the rule breakers. Wherever that is happening, we demand accountability. Now, what JAMP is going to be doing is for giving us, using the access to information as the main tool, and you can have the right to access information, but you can't get information. I'm telling you, Jamaica does a really surprisingly good job with data. I say it because I have had to find data out of Jamaica, and it's so much more harder than you'd imagine. The next thing is that we want to make it understandable. It don't make sense you can access information, but the people cannot understand it. And the fourth is that we also want to give you access to the accountable officers. Have you ever been in the situation where you read the information in the paper and you really want to do something about it, but you just don't know who to talk to? And even if you knew who to talk to, you would know Prince how to access them. Well, this is really the pathway to change that JAMP is taking, and I just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse as to what the tool will look like and how it will operate. What we have here is basically, the portal is a website. It's a user-friendly, citizen-centric website that is not only going to be used by all the citizens here, but also members of government like the Public Accounts Committee, the Auditor General herself, the Cabinet Office, because there is no tracking mechanism in government that tells us how we are doing with remedying these breaches that the watchdog agencies so faithfully report on. This is basically the, and it's very, I, I hope you can see, a very robust search engine. And if you see here, it says, view all breaches. Every Jamaican coming to this site will be able to click there. And at this point in time, we are tracking 47 breaches. That's where we're starting. Now, just for the sake of the presentation, I had typed in the ministry, or I selected the ministry, economic growth and job creation. And if you look to the right, you will see that 12 results would pop up. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to do it live due to internet connectivity, so I'm going to use screenshot. 12 results would pop up, and it, the citizen clicked on this one, which says, wow, look at that. It says NWC 1.78 billion missing from the K-Factor account. You'll recall that from the couple slides ago. So if you wanted to know a little bit more about that, especially in light of the drought conditions and you're really upset, it would take you to a page which would have a small blurb, tell you which ministry that agency reports to. There are lots of agencies that don't report to the ministries you thought it would report to. So NWC reports to economic growth and job creation. And what we have here is a meter because JAMP is not just planning to monitor Kim, we're planning to measure. Now, that data is gonna come from the Auditor General's findings, which is very simply laid out. We've crunched down an entire report into a couple paragraphs. And very importantly, we would like you to be able to share this in the social media space, so those buttons will be there now. In terms of accountability, we know it's the NWC, but most people in here who couldn't tell me who the permanent secretary of the NWC is. And what most Jamaicans don't know is that it is the permanent secretary that is the accountable officer, not the minister. So it will indicate who the permanent secretary is at present that is responsible for correcting the breach. But uh, we thought in fairness, Donna, we would have to explain who the permanent secretary was at the time of the breach. <laughs> in fairness, in fairness. And to the right, it tells you the breach category. This is a resource management issue and further unsupported decision. Now, when you scroll down, this is where I think it becomes a little bit more useful. The breach details that you see here reports on the current status. This is something that JAMP is progressively checking out on. The year it was reported, the last time JAMP assessed it, 
and the year it will be resolved because they're well on their way to fixing this. This would contain the recommendation from the Auditor General or the Public Accounts Committee or the Cabinet, and here you would find JAMP update. And right now, I'm very pleased to let you know that using that same Access to Information Act, we can report that the National Water Commission has paid back $1.775 billion to the account. <laughs> Absolutely. It does happen. So we are tracking to make sure they pay the next $151 million. <laughs> On the right, we have more recent breaches when you come to the page you would actually be able to be pulled in a little bit more to find out what else JAMP is doing. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on articles and reports, but what that is is another level of information. All the reports coming out of this issue will be present at your fingertips. We would have extracted for you from the Auditor General's reports, so you don't have to go look for it. And if the Contractor General had followed up with a report of their own, it would also be on that page. Extracts will be taken from the sessions in Parliament that specifically address the discussions of this sitting so that you can easily find out a little bit more details about how this occurred. And this is the page that I'm a little bit more excited about. So you move from the breach details to the articles and reports, and this is where we reveal who's in charge and give you access to information about how you can talk to them about what you just learned regarding that $1.78 billion. Now, you have the chairman, you have the president, you have the most honorable Andrew Holness, who is the minister responsible for water, and you have the permanent secretary. You are living in a time where you can read, digest, be fully informed, and at the click of a button, Jamaica, you can begin to engage the accountability officer in the space where you can have other citizens now becoming aware of it. Sounds like a plan? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And last, but by no means least, if you follow the train of thought, this is really accountability from here to there. You get the information, you know who the officers are, you engage them, and that tab says call to action. And basically, that is any other citizens group who feels that there is something they want to do about this. They will get in touch with JAMP. You will let us know whether it's a protest, whether it's a town hall meeting, or whether it's just a letter publicly to the Prime Minister that you would have written in the papers, but you want it to be present and associated with the breach, JAMP will post that for you so you can share it and garner more support <laughs> from other citizens. <laughs> Last, but by no means least, not only would you be able to come to this site and find out what's specifically happening with the NWC, but where it says Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation is actually a live link which would take you to the page of the ministry itself. So you would have been able to understand how the NWC is treated with a particular matter, but what if you wanted to know how is the ministry dealing with all matters? And this is where you would find it. Again, it is being metered. At a very quick summary on the right, you can tell how many breaches are we tracking. Seven and three, 10 plus one, 11. You can see that one is fully compliant, seven are partial, and none is Three, nothing has been done. You would be able to get some, we haven't put that in as yet, but some budgetary information. Again, who the accounting officers are. And those 11 breaches would all be present on the page listed below. Yeah? And because this should contain the one about the 1.78 billion, you would find it also, and you'd be able to take yourself right back to the beginning. Now, I'm gonna close by saying that we can't go into that this evening but the other tools for JAMP would include tracking the performance of who? Our members of parliament. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And I'm glad you clapped because it's not just a hall of shame, it's a wall of commendation. There are some members of parliament that's doing a stellar job. A stellar job, a stellar job, a stellar job. At another occasion, because we hope to launch in July, I would be able to take you into details as to how we plan to track it. But I also believe that this is going to trigger the conversation that we've been waiting on for the Prime Minister to talk to us about what? Job description. So here it is, citizens prompting the conversation, and I believe we're going to move it right along. I'm going to close with leaving you with a, uh, a snippet I saw in a newspaper. Those of us who are old enough would remember the public opinion newsletter. 
Um, but I was really struck by something somebody wrote, called himself the seer, and he was looking prophetically ahead to things to come. And it really struck me, and I wanted to share it with you today. He said, the things to come are a people of courage and conviction in our politics, voters with knowledge of their power and how to use it, more righteous deeds, Pat, <laughs> less righteous talk, <laughs> a greater voice in government, a unified public opinion, a party to manifest it, and see that its voice is heard, its needs are met, a loosening of our chains, a general awakening to our conditions, a public will to battle for the betterment of them. Less preferences, less monopoly, less taxes. Would anybody like to guess when that was written? Hillary, anybody? 20, oh, no, you're showing me up now. What year was that? <laughs> anybody? 1950, says Donna. Anybody? I mean, think about what they're saying and see if you could position it. Bobby, Carol, Donna, Elombe. Aye, and the winner is. <laughs> It was the 10th of April, 1937. And I, right before the labor riots. And I dare to say, Jamaica, that this is still as relevant today. And there's no shame in that because these are things that should still be relevant as we move along. So I'm hoping that this seal is speaking prophetically and we are actually going to meet, we are hoping. I wanna thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And I, I want to close on the note that. Um, when I was praying about tonight, I said to the Lord, you know, God, it's very easy for me to stand and speak the facts. I've gotten a little bit used to it. But really and truly, what I want to be able to deliver is the truth. And they're not the same things. These are the facts. But the truth I want to leave with you is hashtag time come. Yeah. Hashtag time come. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only challenge, really, I think we're going to face, which is a challenge I have been facing for the last two years, but I have very good friends in the audience that have been encouraging me, is that there's a still small voice that's going to come and say, it's a good idea, but it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, that's the voice you have to listen out for. I'm 100% sure that this was the voice that probably came when Joan Duncan was on her journey from dressmaker to academic to entrepreneur to trailblazer. And Joan had to learn how to tune that, tune that out. And my prayer tonight is that everybody within the hearing of my voice, listening and joining and outside these walls will develop that same expertise to turn a deaf ear and keep plodding through until we achieve what we want. So, thank you. This is simply phenomenal. Did I hear that she's a UTEC graduate? Wow. I'm so glad I'm here, and I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> Welcome to the new Jamaica. Um, it's a long evening. We have been blessed, and uh, we have been fattened with a lot of information. But I, I'm going to, we can't go before asking a few questions. We have a very limited time. Some of the questions we perhaps have to ask as we have refreshment. So I'm going to open um, the microphone now to invite persons. 
Yes, sir. Um, we have a group. Can we have the microphone here in the middle here? Sir, can you raise your hand? I am so proud of you. <laughs> you have worked quietly, diligently, and put this all together over the past few years. Some of us have been in the background watching it, working with you. And it is a real revelation this evening, which I certainly would like to see change Jamaica for the better. And I think it has the potential to do that because nobody is any longer able to hide under the stone. The fact is, as you point out, with these eight developments, in particular Pleasant Point, we are going to see more and more of these cities for your people who are corrupt cannot hide. And I think you are going to start a whole new revolution <laughs> in terms of things. And I, I just want to, I just want to say that I'm very happy I made the time to be here this evening <laughs> and to participate in this function. And I look forward to seeing more of what you present and how it's going to unfold. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you very Appreciate much. that very much. we're reaching the microphone here. Can I recognize Mr. Duncan who managed to join us? Mr. Duncan? <laughs> right. Executive Group Director. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Ms. Janet Cadler, I'm an 18-year-old um, current head boy of St. Andrew Technical High School. And um, <laughs> When I came this evening, I originally came to Mr. German Barrett, and he said to me, um, Jerome, you know, we're having some discussion about uh, corruption, and it would be good for you to be here. I mean, back, you know, when I was younger, about 19, when I was, <laughs> sorry, when I was about 16, um, you know, I, I just got the idea of what corruption was. I remember it was Dr. Harrison at the time, you know, and, and he cemented the fact that corruption, you know, is a, 